Texas football gets back on track after a couple of tough losses. Texas soccer wraps up their regular season and now looks ahead to postseason play. And Game 5 of the World Series proves to be an instant classic. This is College Press Box. Good evening and welcome into College Press Box. I'm your host, Jonathan Pulaski, and what a week it was for sports. With me now is the man who was in Waco for the Texas game this past weekend against Baylor, Nick Kuholtz. Let's head to McLean Stadium for the highlights. Here we have Baylor quarterback Zach Smith looking for his man, but instead finds Deshaun Elliott, who's going to take it all the way to the end zone for six. The junior's sixth interception of the season, second time finding the end zone, and the Joker performing some of his magic early. And here, after a Baylor fumble, we got ki Texas kicker Joshua Rowland from 27 yards out. The kick is up and is blocked. After a short field, Texas comes away with nothing. Here we have Bouchelle. He's out in the gun. He calls for the snap. He gets it. He's running right. He's looking for his man. Who's he going to find? It's LJ Humphrey in the end zone for six. Colin Johnson's the most athletic receiver, but LJH is not far behind. Huge throw there from Bouchelle, too. After the Baylor punter lets the snap go over his head, Texas takes over at the 28 yard line. And Bouchelle with the quarterback keeper. He's running all the way. He's taking it for six. He's still going. Where's he going? It looks like he's going to TCU. Who says he can't run? Big run there by number seven. Gives Texas a 14 point lead headed into the half. Bouchelle again. This time he swings it out to LJ Humphrey with the Hurdle. Look at that athleticism. L.J. Humphrey. Bouchelle again. This time he hands it off to true freshman Daniel Young. He slices and dices all the way to the end zone for six. Warren and Porter were the original one and two, but huge plays lately from Tony L. Carter and Daniel Young, the true freshman. Final score, 38-7, Texas. This was a great bounce back game for a Texas team that had been struggling a little bit over the past few weeks. And this easily could have been a trap game for Texas going up against a winless Baylor team with TCU looming next week and a couple of key injuries on offense to boot. Despite all that, Texas takes home the win uh, thanks to several players. But who are you most impressed with after this game? You mentioned several players, and I think a lot of Texas Longhorns had their best game of the season. Now, that's not very surprising when you face a team that hasn't won a game all season. But of everyone, I think Tony O'Carter impressed me the most. Set only 70 rushing yards, but on 15 carries, 4.7 yards per carry. He scored twice. One of them got called back for holding, found the end zone once. He's been incredible since he came on. If you look at the Texas running backs, Chris Warren's a, a big runner with a lot of force. He can't pass block very well. Kyle Porter's the opposite. He's a great pass blocker. Struggles actually running the football. I think Tony O'Carter and Joe Young's a great back, too. I think he's just behind Carter. I think the two true freshmen are the best two running backs on this team. But Tony O'Carter, I think, is the best all-around running back on the football team, and I think he had a huge game Saturday. I could easily see Tony O'Carter starting in the near future. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe to start the rest of the season. Who knows? Let's move on to the other side of the ball. Last year, Texas was not a great team defensively by any metric. This year, however, Texas fields one of the best defensive units in the country. Todd Orlando has obviously gotten through to those players. But what's been the difference between this year's team and last year's? You mentioned Todd Orlando, and, and he's the reason for it. Now, a lot of the guys last year had sophomore slumps. Malik Jefferson and Holton Hill, compared to their true freshman seasons, struggled a little bit last year. But Todd Orlando is the main reason. Vance Bedford last year was horrendous as a defensive coordinator. He lost his job in just the fourth game of the season, and Texas couldn't bounce back from the defensive woes to start the early season. Now, Todd Orlando, he might have some head coaching offers. He's, he has turned this defensive round defense around so quickly they are a top you could argue they're a top five team or top five defense in the country I think they are incredible turnaround from how bad they were last year to how exceptional they've been this year they are the reason Texas were in the USC Oklahoma State and OU games and if they had Texas had any sorts of offense they probably would have won that game the defense did everything they could just as they have in every game with the exception of the Maryland Maryland game it, since that game the first one of the season the Texas defense is only let, letting up 16.7 points per game. Incredible job from Todd Orlando's 11. Yeah, Todd Orlando's done an amazing job. He easily could have been the head coach of the University of Houston this year. But when we talk about talented defensive teams, TCU always comes to mind as one of the best units in the country. Texas takes on TCU this upcoming Saturday, and that's after a huge loss to a sneaky good Iowa State team. So, does Texas have any real shot at beating TCU? 
And if so, how can they pull off the first signature victory in the Tom Herman era? They d Texas definitely has a shot, and I think it's unfair to say that Texas, I think any anybody who says Texas doesn't have a chance, that, that's very illogical to me because you look at how Texas has played against these top 10 teams, USC, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma said I know they've lost, they lost all three of those games, but all three times they played a top 10 or top 11, Oklahoma being at 11. They've done an incredible job, and they probably, as I mentioned earlier, should have won all three of those games. I think TCU ends up winning this game because if you compare the Texas and TCU offense and defense, the defenses are very close. I give Texas a slight advantage, actually, but they're, they're very close, and they're two very good defenses. Now, offense, there's a much wider gap, and the TCU, the TCU defensive line is going to have a field day with the Texas front five. The, the TCU defensive line is one of the best in the country, and as we know, the Texas offensive line has struggled from game one till now. I think TCU wins this game. Um, I'll be curious to see if Texas can continue to do what they've done in, a, I def, in the sense that they've come so close to beating these teams. Maybe, hopefully, for Texas fans, they finally get over that hump and defeat a top-10 team. But right now, I think TCU wins, but Texas definitely has a chance come Saturday. It would be great for Tom Herman to get that first right. big win of the season, push Texas on for the, through the rest of the season and into next season. But we'll just have to see. We'll see. Nick, it's always good to have you on. When we return, though, we'll be talking all things Texas sports outside of football. Stick around. Welcome back into College Press Box. Joining me at the desk to discuss all the other Longhorns in action over this past week is Daniel Shee. But before we get into that, Daniel, Texas seemed to have had a pretty successful week across the board, didn't they? Well, yes, they did. They played a lot of different uh, sports and different tournaments, and overall they performed really well. They definitely did. So let's start with men's tennis. Junior Leonardo Tellez took home the singles title at the ITA Texas Regional Championships this past Monday. Tellez defeated yet another ranked opponent in this tournament, this time taking down 40th ranked Johannes Schredder out of Baylor in two sets. Tellus is the first ITA Texas Regional Singles Champion for UT since Daniel Whitehead in 2012. Tellus advances to the college tennis's second major of the year, the ITA National Fall Championships at Indian Wells from November 1st through November 5th. Women's tennis competed at the Robert Eliasson Fall Classic hosted by the University of Alabama this past week. Tex Texas junior Katie Paluta advanced into the finals to face number, number 37 Andy Danielle from Alabama. Paluta would lose in straight sets by the score of 6-1, 6-0. And for Longhorn senior Danny Weigland, her week started with an upset against An Anna Verbenska in the first round. She would advance in the semifinals and finish in fourth place. For the doubles tournament, Paluta and Wagland defeated duels from Mississippi State and Stanford to secure a fifth place finish. Te Texas will wrap up its fall tournament set, uh, season at Indiana Wells this week at the inaugural ITA National Fall Championships. Moving on to cross country, both the men's and women's cross country teams participated in the Big 12 Cross Country Championship this past weekend. On the men's side, the 24th ranked Longhorns came one point shy of winning the Big 12 championship. They ultimately fell 40 to 41 to 23rd ranked Iowa State. Freshman Sam Worley paced the Longhorns and finished third overall with a time of 24 minutes and 12.4 seconds. On the women's side, the Longhorns finished in third place overall. Sophomore Destiny Collins led the Longhorns with a seventh place finish. The NCAA South Central Regional Championships are slated for Saturday, November 11th in College Station. The number three ranked Texas volleyball team faced West Virginia last Saturday. The Longhorns swept the Mountaineers with a score of 25-19, 28-26, and 25-17 as they improved their record to 17 wins and two losses on the season and maintained an undefeated status in the Big 12 play. Senior Sh 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 uh, Shakaya uh, Ogbogu recorded 11, 11 kills and 7 blocks, which led the team in both categories. Sophomore Makaya White posted 9 kills with no errors at a .321 efficiency, while junior Morgan Johnson recorded team-high .556 hitting percentage, getting 6 kills and 1 error. The Longhorns will face Kansas State Wildcats on the road this uh, Wednesday as they look to keep their undefeated rec record in the Big 12 Conference. Let's move to baseball. The Longhorn baseball team played game one of the Orange and White Fall World Series on Sunday with the Orange team claiming a 4-3 victory over the White team. Newcomers Mason Hibbler and Sam Bertelson each hit two home runs for the Orange team. Starter Nolan Kingham got the win for the Orange team and retired seven in a row at one point during the game. 
Game two of the Fall World Series takes place tonight uh, with junior Josh Sawyer and sophomore Blair Henley taking the mound for the orange and white teams respectively. Game three ends on Wednesday. Texas basketball played an exhibition game against Texas A&M at Rice University last Wednesday. The Longhorns beat the Aggies with a score of 73 to 69 as a sophomore guard Andrew Jones uh, scored 18 points shooting 5 for 11 from the field. Freshman star Mohamed Bamba scored 15 points shooting 7 for 11, acquiring two blocks and two steals. The Horns defense limited the Aggies to 30.3% shooting from the field, proving the difference maker of the game. All the proceeds from the game were donated to the Rebuild Texas Relief Fund in help to recover from Hurricane Harvey. The Texas softball team got off to a, harsh, a hot start in fall play. The Longhorns have started off with five wins in a row. After starting off slow against Blinn, the Texas offense managed to get things going against St. Edwards. The Longhorns scored eight runs on 11 hits to put the game out of reach. After close victories against St. Mary's and Weatherford College, the Longhorns exploded against Alvin Community College, scoring 18 runs in five innings. Led by Becca Alcozer's three-run home run and Taylor Ellsworth, who also had three RBIs, the Longhorns were in cruise control from the start. The Longhorns continue their fall slate on Wednesday against McLennan Community College. I was at the soccer game last Friday where Texas lost an overtime thriller against Oklahoma State University to conclude the regular season. Here's the package. Just move on, we're gonna edit the packing and then okay. the show goes off. Okay. Now this was a really tough loss for the Longhorns, but Oklahoma State has been great all year long. So how do you see the Longhorns sparing in the big, not only the Big 12 tournament, but also in the NCAA tournament? Well, I think for the regular season, the Longhorns performed very well. Um, this loss was only their third loss this season. I think um, they exceeded a lot of the expectations set by us, the students, and also um, the school, it, the school itself. Um, so uh, overall, I don't think the Oklahoma State loss uh, make, made the season any disappointing, um, but it's probably just a little bit of dent on this season, but I think overall they performed really well in the season, and I think they will uh, do very well in the NCAA tournament as well. It was definitely a tough way to end the regular season, but as you said, this season has been nothing short of phenomenal for Texas. Daniel, it's been a pleasure to have you on. You always have some good insights. But when we return, Katarina Biancardi and Steve Helwick break down arguably the greatest World Series game of all time, and also a couple of upsets in college football. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Unhooked. I'm Katarina Bardi, B and Cardi, and this is my buddy Steve Hellick. Almost messing up on my last name there. Uh, we're going to recap a thrilling weekend in sports, starting off with the World Series in Houston. Take it away, Steve. I think this might be one of the greatest baseball games we have ever seen in our life. So let's cut to Minute Maid Park, where the Astros and the Dodgers face for a pivotal Game 5 in Houston. That's right. In the early going, Cody Bellinger, after it's tied 4-4, four to four, he's going to boot out a three-run shot here. The Dodgers are up three runs over the Astros, but the Astros will come back. Jose Altuve skies this one to center field. 7-7, seven to seven. that one's over 400 feet. Later on, though, George Springer. This one goes 448 feet. Longest home run out of all seven on the day. And Springer is going to tie this one at eight. Houston back in business in the bottom of the seventh. This one goes into center field. And Alex Bregman's going to run the baseman, run around the bases, remember that name. And Bregman's going to slide in home for the first of two pivotal times tonight. Later on, we have Carlos Correa. And this one's going to go up to the Crawford boxes. And the Astros are going to take an 11 to 8 lead in LA <clears throat> against LA. And later on in the inning, we know that the Dodgers are going to come back because we saw this in game two. And there, Corey Seager is going to boot this one deep. And the Dodgers are going to score 11 to 9 Houston going in to the bottom of the eighth. Brian McCann, the veteran catcher, is going to sling this one out to right field. McCann, this will be his first home run of the postseason. Gives the Astros that commanding three-run lead going into the top of the ninth. A big one there. Later on, Dodgers' Yaziel Puig is going to have something to say about that. And Puig is going to hit two runs to inch the Dodgers just closer to that, uh, to that lead. 
There are two outs, two strikes. Could it be the last pitch of the game? But Chris Taylor is going to bring in Austin Barnes, and Barnes is going to tie this one, send it to extra innings. And, and right there, Steve, we have our own Sean Mapes, who is devastated a Houston fan. But right now, tell me what's going to happen next. Well, Alex Bregman is going to hit this one with two outs, and it looks like Derek Fisher is going to go, and he's going just to beat the throw in time, and the Astros are going to walk away with Game 5 in a thrilling victory in Houston, one of the greatest baseball games we've ever seen. 25 runs, what a wild night, and the Astros are just one game away from winning their very first World Series. Very first Texas World Series as a whole, and they'll be on top in Texas. But most people with the amount of runs like this, there's a lot of balls to be caught right out by the fans. So we're going to take a, to a little bit of video here at Minute Maid Park. Uh, so right here we have Yasiel Puig, who's going to hit with the two-run two run home run, and it's going to hit right nicely to a fan right over there, and he's going to... You know, get the um, get the move the points up. Sorry, the runs up. And right here, I want you guys to zoom and see these fans right here. So right there, a woman has the ball, and then is ripped out by another fan and is thrown back actually in the stadium. So actually, I had no idea about this, and it got blown up everywhere on social media. But actually, Steve, it is a tradition in Minute Maid that all Astro fans throw back all opposing teams' home run balls. Still valuable World Series memorabilia, though. Does so there's a little a bit of a conflict right I there. I absolutely agree, but I guess it's a, uh, an Astros uh, tradition, and it works for them, and uh, maybe it will absolutely work for them when they um, hopefully clinch the World Series. <laughs> now switching things back to college football, we're going to take it right to Columbus in the horseshoe. Penn State in Ohio State right here in the horseshoe. We have Penn State cutting in, and it's blocked by the Buckeyes. A huge momentum shift. We're starting right here in the fourth quarter. Ohio State's down by 15, and maybe a little bit of momentum is gearing up right here. Uh, Barrett with the ball. He's going to try to run, uh, throw that ball deep, and he sure enough finds his buddy Johnny Dixon. Johnny Dixon in the middle for that touchdown. But shortly after, Penn State makes a field goal. Barrett with the ball again. He finds his buddy once again, Johnny Dixon. And they try to go for two, but unfortunately, they don't get it. But you see that there's a bit of a momentum shift here. With less than two minutes left, Barrett with the ball. He finds his buddy, Marcus Bow. And for the first time, Ohio State takes the lead for the game. And there's a little bit of a comeback here coming, right? And two, a two-point conversion has failed by the Buckeyes. Penn State's going to try one more time to reclaim this victory here. But unfortunately, they do not. The pass goes incomplete. And the Buckeyes take this one 38 to 39. Moving on to Ames, Iowa, we got a ranked matchup between TCU and Iowa State, who hasn't been ranked since 05. Kyle Kemp undefeated as a starter finds Matthew Eaton for the touchdown here. 7 0 Cyclones. This time, Akeem Butler, what a grab, drags two feet in. They review this one. And Butler has got Iowa State two touchdowns ahead of the number four team in the nation. Look at that little jet celebration there. But you know, TCU is going to come back and start scoring. Start of the second half, Kevontae Turpin is going to take this one. He's going to go right through the defenders, untouched, 94 yards to the house, and he's leading the pack of all the red guys there, and he gets into the end zone. And TCU is finally on the board, but you know that TCU offense hasn't scored yet, and they need to finally get started. So Kenny Hill's going to go look for Turpin, but Brian Peavy gets it on the overthrow, and Peavy, here's a real momentum shift. They're going to take this one about 70 yards. Unfortunately for the Cyclones, they're going to miss the field goal, which would put them up two possessions, giving life to the TCU offense. So Kenny Hill going to try to win this one here or tie it up. Instead, he gets stripped, sacked, fumbled. Iowa State recovers, and the Cyclones are going to go on and upset TCU in Ames. This is their second top five that win this year. They beat Oklahoma, now they beat TCU. The Cyclones are taking everyone by surprise. I Who know, would have surely, ever thought this was coming? I think that the Big 12 always happens to be a little bit um, uneasy, a little bit shaken up. And speaking of shakeups, Steve, after this past weekend, the college football rankings got shook up. And uh, predictions are a little bit different. So what teams are now thriving and which teams are barely surviving? I'd say the trending teams right now, you have to look at Notre Dame. This is a team that goes 4-8 and eight a year ago. And this, and they just soundly have beaten every single team on their schedule except for number two, Georgia, who they only lost by one point. Yeah. They go in, they beat a rank, uh, currently ranked Michigan State team by over 20 on the road. Mm -hmm. They beat NC State last week 35-14. Uh, to 14. And before that, they just demolished USC 49-14. to 14. Notre Dame right now is playing as one of the best teams in the nation. Their running game is strong. They've played good defense. So I think they're trending up. And then, as we saw earlier, Ohio State with that win. Ever since that loss to Oklahoma, the Buckeyes have dismantled all their easy competition. They finally get that tough game. Then the rest of their schedule is just downhill from here. 
So both those teams, Notre Dame and Ohio State, they're looking on the upswing for the rest of the season. Now, with surprise uh, upsets, just like the one we saw you review here, Ohio State, I mean, Iowa State and TCU, does this upcoming week have any, um, these upcoming weekend uh, matchups come up with anything that might surprise us? Oh, definitely. Whenever there's seven ranked matchups in a week, which I believe is the most this season, and every single ranked team is facing a team with a winning record or 500, except for Mississippi State, who's playing UMass. Yeah. So there's plenty of room for these top 25 teams. Lots of separation we'll see this week. We have a, the ACC uh, title game might be decided this week. We have mm -hmm. NC State playing Clemson on the Atlantic side, and then undefeated Miami, who wins by the skin of their teeth every week, playing yeah. Virginia Tech. So so ACC, if they want to make playoffs, this is their week. And then we have Bedlam, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. That has some exciting Big 12 action to decide. Oh, I mean, the Big 12 has TCU, Iowa State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Those teams are all going to start beating each other. Mm -hmm. And then we'll finally decide who gets in that inaugural Big 12 championship game and if that has any playoff implications. And then there's uh, Alabama, LSU, and yeah, Penn State. Yeah, can't forget about the SEC. <laughs> and then Penn State, Michigan State, which might have some SEC or Big 10 playoff implications, you too. You hope so for your uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a lot there's a lot of games this week mm -hmm. uh, between ranked teams and I think this will be the most exciting one yet. Well, I'll hold you to that <laughs> till next week, Steve. That's all the time we have here on On Hook. I'm tossing things back to Jonathan where he'll preview what's going around the 40 acres. Stay tuned. Welcome back to College Press Box for the final time tonight. Let's bring you up to date on what's coming up this week in Longhorn Sports. On Wednesday, November 1st, the women's volleyball team takes on Kansas State at Kansas State at 8 p.m. You can catch that on ESPNU. Also on Wednesday, but through Sunday, is the women's soccer team will participate in the Big 12 Championship, while the men's tennis team participates in the ITA Fall Nationals. On Friday, November 3rd, the men's and women's swimming and diving team will uh, take on Texas A&M at Texas A&M. And on sa Saturday, November 4th, the volleyball team takes on Texas Tech at 2 p.m. You can catch that on LHN, while the football team takes on TCU at TCU at 6.15. You can see that on ESPN. Now, before we go, Tiger Woods announced this afternoon that he will return to competition at the Heroes World Challenge in the Bahamas. Jordan Spieth, a Texas X, is in the field as the new face of golf in a post-Tiger era. Now, there's no guarantee, but there is a possibility that a prime Jordan Spieth and a healthy Tiger could be going at it for the next few years to come. And to see Tiger and Jordan going at it, both two transcendental talents in the world of golf, that would just be one of the greatest sports stories to see for these next few years. We'll be back again next week to break down Texas's game against TCU and all the other Longhorns in action this week. And don't forget to tune in on Wednesday at 9 p.m. for our live sports debate show, College Crossfire, hosted by Mark Skoll Jr. as he and the panel break down everything from Longhorn football to the World Series. For everyone here at TSTV Sports, I'm Jonathan Pulasic. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>